So, the other day, I was talking about the four states of consciousness and how light appears differently. And actually, there are three kinds of light in meditation. Well, we'll get to suffering in a minute. <laughs> First, I want to add that when you close your eyes in meditation, the first light is usually an after image. Try this at home at night when it's pretty dark. Just uh, light a flashlight and point it at your face just for a second and then turn it off. And you'll see an after image of the light apparently floating in space in front of you. So our eyes are like in a, in a sense, like photographic plates. That there's a certain after image. It's just technically called hysteresis. So it goes away in a few minutes. But don't think when you first sit down and close your eyes that you're seeing inner light. <laughs> it's nothing spiritual. It's just your eyes uh, retaining the image of whatever light you were looking at before. Then, when you start to move into the uh, svapna consciousness, when the mind starts to become concentrated, you're going to see flashes of light, usually blue light, pure blue. And after a while, the light will begin to coalesce as the concentration gets stronger and stronger. The lights will uh, come together in some kind of a blurry form. And usually by this time, they're a warm color, a yellow or reddish color, not dark red. If deep red light comes to you, there's something wrong. <laughs> but like the color of a candle flame and kind of amorphous and shapeless, you know, just a, a glom of light. <laughs> This is from the Svapna stage. To get to the real light, the light of consciousness, because Svapna is just a mind, it's just a dream, you have to go through the void. You have to go through Sushupti. But once you do, you'll start to see this more bluish light. And this light is spread out all over blue like the sky. I mean, it's almost white, but just a little tinge of blue. Oh, and I should mention that the Swapna light is not only yellow, red color, it's kind of sparkly. Huh? It's a funny thing. It just, you know, fades in and out, <laughs> changes shape, moves here and there. Uh, but don't pay much attention to it. It's just a sign your mind is becoming concentrated. Okay, now why do we do all this? Why do we spend hours in meditation and studying shastras and chanting mantras and doing pujas and all this? Well, it's simple because we're suffering. We're suffering and we want relief or release. So this is the first noble truth of the Buddha. Life is suffering. Very simple. Now, some people will say, well, sometimes I'm suffering, but sometimes I'm not. But hold on. Analyze it this way. Whenever anybody says anything or tries to do anything, the subtext is suffering. What do I mean by a subtext? I mean the hidden meaning or the not directly stated meaning. Huh? Like people ask you, how are you? Huh? 
<laughs> no, I'm suffering. Oh, I'm suffering so much. But nobody says they say, oh, I'm fine. Why? Because there's competition in society and the weaker people are rooted out. See, if you're suffering, you're made to suffer more. <laughs> this is our wonderful human society. As I made the comparison the other day to crabs in a basket. If anybody starts to climb up and out of the, the den of suffering, everybody else grabs them and tries to pull them back down. So this is our wonderful human society. Actually, the Buddha pointed out that everything in life is suffering, even so-called enjoyment. Why? Because that enjoyment has to end. So deep down in your mind, you know this, and it puts you in anxiety. Oh, what am I gonna do when this suffering is over? See, there's no such thing as pure enjoyment in the material world, in jagrat consciousness. Jagrat means perceiving a multitude of things. See, that right there is suffering. Because those things are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. <laughs> So everything that we perceive is actually a source of suffering. Everything we experience, everything we do, even our efforts to get out of suffering. Now look, every scheme and plan proposed by every politician or leader, every invention by a scientist or engineer, Every economic plan, like corporations and so on like that, are efforts to reduce suffering. Religion, here's a good one. Religion, right up front, promises to relieve your suffering. But does it? <laughs> Usually they just increase it. So everything in life, hospitals, companies, banks, corporations, governments, armies, weapons even, huh? are actually motivated by the desire to reduce or eliminate suffering. But do they? No. I mean, take laws, for example. <laughs> laws are supposed to shape people's activities in such a way that there's no suffering or there's less suffering in human society. Have they worked? Huh? If you do this, then you'll get this punishment. Huh? Has it worked? After thousands of years of human society? No, sir. <laughs> human nature remains the same and people are basically cheaters. Frauds and cheaters. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine. No, no, you're not. Let's be honest. We're not fine. We're in this material world where we have to grow old and die. Are we fine? No, we're never fine. Unless we take up the sadhana. And the first item of sadhana in the Jagrat consciousness is karma yoga. We give in charity. Uh, we do nice things for people. We follow religious process of some kind. Uh, it's, it's mundane, yes, but it creates good karma for the future. We have to at least be comfortable, uh, a comfortable level of suffering that we can tolerate before we can aspire to anything higher. So yes, taking care of business, making a, a secure economic base, having a, a good social environment, all these things are important prerequisites for the spiritual path. Next, there's the Swapna consciousness. Swapna means dreams. So what happens in a Swapna consciousness, the path, huh? this is uh, Bhakti Yoga. And what is bhakti yoga? A better dream. Bhakti yoga 
directs our thoughts to some transcendental object, usually a deity or the self, Brahman. And by directing our thoughts in this way and doing worship and meditation, chanting mantras and so on, that way we start to come out of the suffering and we start to see that the cause of suffering is our desire for self. Desire for an individual self and then the various attachments to that self, such as possessions, actions, thoughts, and so on. Uh, we want to be a separate self. That's the cause of suffering. That's the second noble truth. First noble truth is life is suffering. Why is life suffering? Because we want to have this individual identity, this individual existence, and all the stuff that goes with it, <laughs> which is all suffering. So we start to unload or unwind this individual existence for existence as a part of God or in relation to God which is, amounts to the same thing. This is bhakti. And bhakti, of course, also gives rise to ecstasy. So we not only replace a, the cause of our suffering, but we experience directly happiness as a result. Now, if you're not getting this happiness out of your bhakti practices, it means something is wrong. You should get bliss. You should get ecstatic symptoms. You should feel light. You should feel happy. Uh, you should get rushes of energy all over your body. You should start to cry sometimes when you think how beautiful God is, and so on. So this is to understand and begin to alleviate the cause of suffering. And what's next? Sushupti. In Sushupti, we finally come to the path to the end of suffering. We have to know that there is an end of suffering, and we have to know something about it. The Buddha, of course, calls it Nibbana or Nirvana. We could call it Samadhi or enlightenment or self-realization, but it's there. Now, how do you approach it? By meditation. This is Raj Yoga. And in Raj Yoga, nothing is needed. You don't have to do anything. Just sit there and watch as your mind comes up with dream after dream after dream. Huh? Yeah, of course. That's Swapna consciousness. So in Sushupti consciousness, every time the mind comes up with a dream, you're like, no, not this. No, not that. No, not this, not that. <laughs> huh? Neti neti, this is called. And this is the basic plan of meditation. That really, there is nothing but the self. So in meditation, slowly we enter the void. And the void is the place where there is no thing, nothing. Huh? This is meditation. And so the meditation is actually the path to the end of suffering. And what is the end of suffering? Well, it's kind of hard to describe. <laughs> Ajata consciousness. Ajata means unborn. And the type of consciousness in which we see the world as unborn is Turiya. Turiya consciousness means the fourth. And in Turiya consciousness, we see the other three stages of consciousness as illusory, as unborn. They were never born. They don't really exist. They're just dreams, illusions, thoughts at the most. But they're not real. Why aren't they real? <laughs> because they're impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. In Turiya consciousness, we know that which is eternal and is satisfactory, is full of bliss, and it is the self. Uh, it's our self. So in Turiya, it's a very interesting point of view. 
Because in Turiya consciousness, the other three kinds of consciousness are its objects. So we're looking at waking, dreaming, and deep sleep as objects. And so because those are simply consciousness, really there is no duality because the self is consciousness and these other three consciousnesses are its object. So there's no subject-object duality because all of them are as nothing but the self. This is enlightenment. This is self-realization. This is the end of suffering. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.